Hi guys, welcome to the Economic Circle. I'm Dr. Alex Mosley, the founder. In this video, I'm going to be taking you through a presentation on the balance of payments, part of the A to Z of economic concepts that I'm creating. And this will also give you the definitions of the balance of payments, followed by an analysis and a critique with some tools to evaluate balance of payments issues, i.e. are they a problem at all, and if so, when so. Okay, so enjoy the presentation and look forward to having any comments from you. Okay, cheers. Bye now. So here's a presentation on the balance of payments. Now, what is the balance of payments? Well, when a country imports and exports, statisticians attempt to assess the value of that foreign trade. The payments going back and forth must balance, though, and this is an absolute critical thing to remember, that there's two main accounts that we look at that summarise the flows of things going into a country and going out of a country. When one of the accounts is in deficit, the other must make up for it. The balance of payments must balance. Remember that, because that's often forgotten in basic media comments when we hear um, the balance of payments is in surplus or the balance of payments is in deficit. No, it's not. It cannot be because it must balance. It's an accounting definition. Nonetheless, what people are often referring to is a specific element or one of the accounts is in deficit, and therefore the other one must, by definition, be in surplus. Right, there are two accounts that we look at. The first one is the current account, which involves looking at the exports and imports of goods and services. This is often broken down into something called the visible trade account. Now, that's the trade, the exchange of physical goods, and the invisible trade account, which is the exchange of services. Both of them are also referred to as the balance of trade. So the balance of trade can be in deficit if we're buying in more goods and services than we're actually selling abroad. But remember, from the balance of payments, it must balance overall because your other account that we're going to be looking at is going to be paying for that deficit. It also includes, on the current account, money earned from investments abroad. So if you've got some factories abroad, uh, paying profits, dividends, etc., coming back to the home country, um, take away money going to foreign investors who may own factories in this country, for example. And there's also unilateral transfers. So when people working in the United States may send money back to Mexico or people working in Britain sending money back to India or people in India sending money back to Sri Lanka or China to Hong Kong, who knows. The current account is often that which attracts media attention. And for a lot of economics in the late 20th century, and we'll go back to the 30s really, the current account, particularly the visible trade, was something that people focused on a bit too much, if you ask me, because it's almost it's like, well, we can see cars going out and we can see cars coming in, and this is a disruption if more cars are coming in than going out, because we can see them. However, that's ignoring the services or the invisible trade account where we earn money on things like banking and insurance and other services such as tourism. Right? Um, here's a balance of payments example from the United States, uh, going from 1992 to ooh, March 2015, quite a, a recent one. Sometimes it's difficult to get a hold of recent data. And you can see that the balance of pa payments um, on the trade account, this would be, see what, <laughs> see what I mean by this US balance of payments. This is the trade account, so goods and services and visibles, has gone down from um, starting off almost at a zero down to a uh, lows around 2006, 7 and 8. And not surprisingly, there's a financial crisis at that point, and then it started to bounce back up and recover. Uh, the United States obviously hit quite an issue there. So again, what I've just noticed there, that this is called the balance of payments. It's actually the balance of trade account. As I've said, it's the current account that often gets most attention. Now, within commentators, there is often a focus on the visible account compared to the invisible account, such as tourism and banking, so I've covered that already. The capital account is the second account. This is best understood as assets held abroad, less foreign assets owned in the country. It's also called the financial account, and the two merge a little bit in people's minds. And this is where sometimes we split it into a third account to look at the finances as to what we have in terms of uh, currency assets or gold, for example. Now, if you purchase an asset abroad, say a factory, then the capital account shows a deficit as money leaves the country. On the other hand, if a foreigner buys a factory here, then it shows an increase in the capital account as money flows in. Now, this is often referred to as FDI, or foreign direct investment. And that's often seen as a good thing, because foreigners are putting money into the country. When people put money into your country, uh, we're like, wow, thank you very much. And that helps to build structures, uh, factories, etc., infrastructure sometimes, 
uh, and improve the goods and services we can then offer. Of course, the dividends and the payments, the profits, may be um, sent abroad afterwards, though, and that's another issue. Now, the financial account, which is part of the capital account overall, or assets account, focuses on the money, such as the gold, foreign currency reserves, but also, for some reason, claims to land. I'm not sure why. That move in and out of the country as well. Now, these have repercussions for exchange rates and also help to explain liberalisation as a country moves towards freeing up capital and financial flows right, with other countries. So that's often in the news that uh, we want to... So Argentina, for example, may impose capital restrictions, i.e. they don't want money or investment capital reserves, assets to leave the country. They want to keep it in. That's usually a bad sign. It's usually um, quite predictive of a government struggling or an economy that's struggling and the government's panicking a little bit, right? Now, analogy. Let's use a domestic analogy here. The balance of payments can be analysed using a simple review of personal finances. I earn income on the services that I sell, or my job, let's say. I then spa spend part of that income on goods and services. Thus far, we're talking about my current account or my checking account, as it were. Money comes in from sales, money gets spent on the stuff of life. And it's the same with the country. I also save part of my money. That goes into my savings account. These constitute my reserves for buying assets. Now, this is the equivalent of a nation's financial account as part of the capital account, or the just focus on the financial because it's money going in. The asset that you buy may then be a savings fund that pays interest or dividends, which is what most people do. They save money, put it into a savings account, then the dividends or income from that savings account may be paid into the checking account. Well, may, you may keep it in your savings account and let it grow on compound interest, of course. So when an investor buys a factory abroad, she's going to reduce her financial reserves to acquire that asset. The asset may be sold later for profit, and that money would return with growth. So her savings account then goes up. But let's say she keeps the asset abroad, so her financial reserves have gone down, but she's now taking profits from that asset abroad, and that's going to be part of her income. And therefore, it's going to be registered as money's coming in to her current account. Simply put, so if we have a look at here's your income, Salary, dividends and profits coming in. So we'll come back to that in a second. This is nice and circular. Money goes out in terms of expenditures, such as rents, food, utilities, whatever you buy. Now, let's have a look at your assets. On the bottom, we've got assets versus liabilities. So the top one is your cash flow. So, uh, bottom one down, the two quartiles are assets owned versus liabilities. So you may own a factory. That's nice. You may have a mortgage on the factory. Uh-oh, we owe somebody for it. We owe some commercial land. And again, we owe a mortgage on that land. We have a retail outlet, whoopee, but we've taken a business loan. Now, the net income after you've paid off the monthly mortgage and loan payments on these three businesses, that net income then goes into your current account in the form of dividends and profits. Now, of course, what you may do is take that net income and put it into a savings account, which can then buy more assets, which is the clever thing to do. Critique. What's the fuss over the balance of payments? Well, firstly, most of the fuss is over the current account, as we've suggested. How much a country imports and exports in terms of goods and services. Now, this is a bit like focusing on your incomes and expenditures, which is, of course, prudential. You must focus on your cash flow. But the balance of payments system is not about individuals. It's about countries. And countries, if you haven't noticed, are massive conglomerates of millions of people acting in millions of markets. In fact, more than we can imagine. The national figures that are created refer to collectives rather than individuals. Yet those collectives are artificial. They are political jurisdictions. Um, a quick analogy here is I often mention this to uh, British pupils, say, OK, uh, there are 23 goals scored in the Premier Division on Saturday, but that's just a conglomerate. How did your team get on? How did Arsenal get on? How did Chelsea get on, etc.? Right? Different question, isn't it? In many respects, if we break down the conglomerate, we don't worry about trade between, let's say, Manchester and London, or Paris and Marseille, or New York and Detroit. It's only because we're historically we've, we've created borders, through, usually through warfare and other means, that economists then draw lines around, around these countries and create schemes, statistics, to examine what comes in and out. Now, I think most people in the country, um, in Britain, for example, would find it risible, laughable, to hear that Manchester was suffering an imbalance of trade. It may be, 
<laughs> we don't know. More importantly, we don't care. Now, one day, this may be true of nation states, that we won't be talking in economics about the balance of trade between countries. Secondly, economic problems do arise if a nation is overspending on its current account. Now, this is true for individuals. If expenditure is greater than income, then savings or assets has to be reduced to cover the deficit. May also require borrowing from other, other people or banks to inject cash into the current account, which, of course, in turn increases liabilities. In other words, things that have to be paid off. The same with nations. If a nation is spending too much, it's facing a, a balance of trade crisis or a sovereign debt crisis, then it may have to borrow money from international banks or the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, etc., to get it out of the crisis. But, of course, that increases its liabilities. As of writing, where are we? June 2015, Greece is going through this issue, has been for many years, and it's struggling to keep up with payments. The economy's turning around, but ah, there's a lot of things going on there, and we have to look at what the Greek government's doing, overspending, etc., and what the negotiations will turn out to be. So it's an interesting one to keep your eye on, or if it's already happened, to have a look what did happen and what happened to Greece as a result. Evaluation. So... How do we evaluate the balance of payments for problem? Well, learn that there is no balance of payments problem as such. It's only problems within each account. So it's like if a person is overspending and running down savings. We can then ask, well, what's the reason for doing this, mate? Well, there may be a justifiable reason, such as he's investing in his education. He's at university. He's not earning as much because after finishing his course, his degree, for example, he can improve his wealth prospects and earn more money. Fair dues. On the other hand, if there's no reason for what he's doing, except that we do see him, par see him partying a lot, there's a problem arising. Savings will decrease, borrowings will rise, and if he doesn't change course, there's likely to be a cash flow crunch and possible bankruptcy. And it's the same with a nation. Advert. Two seconds. If you take an Economics A level, by the way, or Econ 101 courses, I've got about 120 videos available for the whole course for a very reasonable fee on economics-circle.com. How cool is that? And also, we've got the magazine, The Economic Circle. Please subscribe. Uh, very reasonable fee. You get uh, monthly issues on particular aspects of economics. So we've looked at sovereign debt. Um, in this one, I'm looking at principles of money. We've looked at commodities. I think next month's going to be growth, etc. So each one's going to be themed. So it provides a nice um, collection of articles for you to read uh, in a readable manner. Um, nothing too technical. Good stuff. Now... Let's go back to nations. Nations can do the same thing as individuals in this regard. Although we're collectivizing them as an issue there, investing can take investing in the country can take resources. And if we're following a plan that will empower the nation into prosperity, a short-term deficit on the current account, like the visible trade account, because we're buying raw materials, makes sense. But if that spending is on consumer goods and it shows no let up, it's gaining momentum then a currency crisis can occur. Savings, such as reserve currencies, are diminished. Then it becomes harder for the people of the country, or the country as a whole, or the government, if that's, that's on a spending spree, to borrow. Another issue to be aware of is exchange rate regimes. If the exchange rate is fixed, then the pain of overspending will be felt earlier, and some would say more keener. On a positive side, it also pulls people or nations up quicker if they can't alter the exchange rate in their favour because right? you can't cheat, as it were. That is, if a nation devalues its currency, though, it can pay off its debt with cheaper monies. What? Yep, it can print its way out of a financial hole. Now, individuals can't do this without committing criminal fraud, but nations can, as they have access to printing presses. Yes, they're also committing moral and economic fraud. Well spotted. Give that person a name. The overspending may then continue for longer because they're just printing money to keep the consumer habits going. But ultimately, the crisis, the crisis we could argue, may be longer, deeper, more painful because so much economic noise or distractions have been created when countries have printed money. Now, you and I can't do that, but knowing that countries can to get out of a balance of payments issue on the trade account or the, the current account, this helps to explain a lot of what goes on in the world. Okay, hope you enjoyed that. Definitions, an analogy, and evaluation. I hope you've enjoyed the sound of summer, including the lawnmower now, uh, <laughs> in Britain, June 2015.
Thanks for listening, guys, and see you in the next video. Cheers. Bye now.